Thanks for the introduction, Christine. Um, yeah, our view of soil has changed with time. Um, humans have talked about tilth and fertility and quality, and, and now we're in a meeting about soil health and regenerative agriculture, and that's incorporating that idea of sustainability and ecosystem services and, and going from on-farm to off-farm ecosystem services. And I think that's coming at the view, as Shannon talked about, of we're recognizing the importance of soil biology within that. And um, Christine gave us a really nice introduction to the project itself and, and mentioned, um, I'm just so thrilled that this paper came out in Agronomy Journal. It's available open access. and identifies the background um, of the project, identifies the sites, how the samples were collected, and also lists all the measurements that are being done and that we've heard about today. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about, one in relation to soil biology, is the phospholipid fatty acid procedure, the PLFA procedure. And so I'm, I've begun to talk about this with maybe people who haven't heard about it before or, or just aren't as familiar with it, a little bit about like clothes and, and the idea that PLFAs are closed. They, they form this sort of protective layer around the microbe. They're part of the membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane. Um, they vary in their structure. And if the microbial community is not present, then you won't be able to extract these biomarkers, these different clothes. So they indicate an active uh, community that's present. And so when you do the procedure and you extract these biomarkers, you get um, sort of different chemistries associated with that. And you can make inferences um, of those chemistries to who was present. Sort of if you have a tube that's present, you might say, oh, that belonged to maybe a Fisher kind of bacteria that was present, or if you have a t-shirt, maybe it was a farmer kind of bacteria that was present within your system. So that's sort of the way to look at it. You've got these different types of markers coming off and they can be representative of the different type of microorganisms that are in your soil. And when we work with PLFA, we talk about it in two different ways. We talk about it in terms of quantity first. So we have our fissure and our farmer bacteria in our soil. And they're in a, in a household and, and we use the PLFA procedure and we're pulling off these two markers. Um, so at the end of the week, you have a pretty light laundry load. But if our fissure and our farmer household invite some buddies over and they stay at their household, your laundry load gets much bigger. But you have very similar types of biomarkers coming off. So you have this idea that the more biomarkers you're extracting from the soil, the greater your microbial biomass that you have present um, there. So that's one way that we look at um, the data that we get off from the PLFA procedure. The second way is looking at composition. So we have our five member uh, household and they're all fishers and farmers. So you have toques and t-shirts, so that kind of idea. But if our initial uh, fisher and farmer decided to say, hey, no, I want to hang out with artists and loggers and techies and all kinds of different people, then um, you are looking at that in terms of a greater diversity within the laundry basket. So you've got that idea there. So you have um, more uh, different biomarkers, different chemistries and different associations there. So you look at the PLFA data in terms of um, quantity and composition is the way that we look at it. And so that's what I want to talk about today too. Christine identified that it's more of a tier two, kind of like what Liz talked about in terms of genomics. It's just not as well understood perhaps as our, um, the way we recognize so pH and uh, texture and total carbon. Uh, we understand the range and the scope of those, of those measurements, but not, it's not the same in terms of the biologicals and certainly with the PLFA. So, I just pulled off an example lab report here, and they'll often give you a total. So I just want to talk about total co totals um, and then also a little bit about composition and how it'll vary across um, different um, conditions, inherent conditions. And so the composition can be referred to um, as this report does in terms of ratio. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and the challenges and the direction that I'm taking with this data set. So getting at this idea of quantity and composition um, and, and, and getting at how does the total and the composition vary with uh, the texture and the pH and carbon 
um, and then the climate. And, and just to get a, more of a handle on this, um, because it's a tier two kind of idea, and, and it's coming from the idea that the PLFA procedure is not standardized across America. Different labs um, sort of have slightly different ways of doing this, of, of, of their analytical procedures. So you want to get a sense of what the data is telling you and what the range is. We also have landscape variation and seasonal variation. So to take out one of these variables was management first. And so I did that by just looking at exclosures or prairies, grasslands, like this continual per, uh, perennial cover for at least five years to get at the idea of composition and quantity. So looking at that, I mean, we've already seen some of this data presented in other ways. Um, we've got with uh, mean annual temperature on our x-axis and the total PLFA biomass, this increasing bar, uh, biomarkers or increasing laundry load along the y-axis. Um, and then the points, again, these are just representative of these unmanaged plots. And generously speaking, um, we have a decreasing trend in biomass with increasing temperature, but it's messy data. We kind of know that, and that's what Dan was showing with the lack of correlations um, with other measures. So um, again, these are the unmanaged ones, and there was 27 sites overall out of our 120 or so sites that had uh, one to four plots that were unmanaged. So that's why some have um, de standard deviation bars and others don't. Some had replication and some didn't. But, and then, so within the site, there was a fair amount of variation as well. And then just looking at it in terms of total carbon, increasing total carbon, increasing biomass. So it, it, that general trend as well that we would expect, increasing energy source for the microbial community, increasing biomass. So the other point that I want to make on this slide is to identify the units. I am reporting these in nanomoles a gram of dry soil. I reported in micromoles per gram of dry soil, so you're out by a factor of 1,000. Or you can now start to report on a, on a carbon basis. So it's another thing to keep in mind also when you're looking at uh, your data and you're comparing across uh, reports is to, to think about the units that are being used and this lack of standardization in, in this procedure. So that's just a little bit about the quantity and the range that we have. We've got about 50 to about 600 nanomoles per gram in terms of these unmanaged systems, this continual uh, perennial cover. But getting into the idea of composition and just talking about sort of maybe who's there and, and, and it's often discussed in the literature in terms of a fungal to bacterial ratio or this gram positive to a gram negative ratio or a saturated to unsaturated. Um, so this is just giving sort of like the type of organism that the biomarkers might be associated with. And the saturated to unsaturated um, means that the unsaturated is um, relating to the chemical structure and you have a double bond present within it. So it changes the, um, the structure in terms of the space that it'll take up. So it's a, it's a more bulky molecule than the saturated um, uh, uh, structures and so you can't stack them together as well so they're more uh, fluid and flexible as compared to saturated so that's that's that idea and this is the way the data is talked about and it's been reported and and it came out of the uh, seminal literature in the early 90s where this PLFA um, extraction procedure was brought into the soil science realm and again, what you're doing is you're just pulling off these markers. You're pulling off our toques and t-shirts from, uh, from the bacterial community. And based on the structure, the chemistry that was pulled off, the, uh, the researchers took those chemistries and went back to the microbiology literature and said from these pure cultures, um, these bacteria were dominated by certain chemistries. So we will now call this chemistry a gram negative or a gram positive kind of one. And so we looked at it in that way. Um, but I, I've certainly reported on that and I've talked about it and um, 
what I found though, and, and Matthew and I have found in our research, is that sometimes our toque is really important in our research. And we go back in the literature and we try and figure out, well, what's that really associated with? And we find out that, oh, it's not always the fisher, sometimes it's the farmer. So then it's, it's ambiguous as to which marker is sometimes associated with which microorganism type. So we have that challenge. And in the literature, what Matthew and I have also found is this idea that both our fisher and our farmer um, bacteria are finding that they change um, in terms of the, the chemical structure of their biomarkers depending on the environment. So if it's hot, they'll both wear t-shirts, or if it's cold, they'll both start wearing toques. So you have this idea. And then, so what we're looking at and suggesting is this uh, shift to an environmental ratio and going from this genomic, uh, genotypic kind of classification of calling it microorganisms to the idea of going to um, uh, a response to the environment. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, and so that's what the unsaturated to saturated ratio is. So this isn't a new idea. It's, it's present within the community and it's what we've got. Um, and then, so we're looking at that and um, what we're finding is that the, the idea is that we've got a decrease with the mean annual temperature compared to the unsaturated to saturated ratio. So you've got more of the double bonds um, associated with the biomarkers um, in the cooler soils as compared to the warmer soils. And so again, we're still in these unmanaged plots. And what we've got here um, is this, this change in ratio. And this one is incorporating all the markers from 14 to, um, to 20 and, and those that are unsaturated and saturated. And so I've included ones here that are 38. But again, you have to go to the materials and methods of each of the procedures to understand which markers are being included. So I think there's ambiguity as well in, in reporting this ratio. Another ratio that we found and that's presented is this idea of an anti-ISO to an ISO of 15 and 17. So you've only got four markers here. And they're showing the same idea. Anti-ISO takes up more space as compared to an ISO. So more anti-ISO uh, biomarkers take up more space, they're more fluid, they're more flexible. So it's the same idea as unsaturated and saturated. And you've got the same trend um, with um, uh, increasing temperature, you've got a decreasing ratio. So I think this is really interesting and offers promise in the clarity in a biomarker where, where there's less ambiguity in that. And then so we took another subset of the data. We went um, in, from those unmanaged plots, we went to the idea of um, intensively agriculture uh, plots. We have six of those in the data set, and those are represented here as different colors. And then the points are also coded by the shape um, in terms of um, the business as usual or soil health management practice. And we know from the microbiology literature that the um, bacteria respond to low pH, that kind of stressful environment, by being more rigid in this um, in their in their response of their um, bacterial cells, in the, and so you have a lower ratio, but as pH increases, the cells are more fluid, your ratio increases. So it's really interesting to me that not only do you see that in the pure culture, but we're seeing this in this heterogeneous mixture of soil across the landscape. So as, as Liz showed, we're finding some really interesting pH trends. And then so that's across the landscape, but I'm interested now in pulling in the idea of management and how that is relating to um, um, the overall environment for the microbial community. And so this is a little bit different. We've, we've seen a bunch of response ratios so far. Um, and so that's just another, uh, this is just a little tweak on how it's been presented so far. My business as usual is my reference sort of that I'm calling and how does the soil health management practice improve or decrease um, sort of the response of this ratio to that. So to the uh, right, I've got this increase in soil health management practice ratio. And then to the left, there's a decrease in that idea. And then, I, oh, I forgot to mention, I've also wanting to move from the idea of just this inherent uh, measurement of pH to the response of the microbial community to the idea of how the microbial is supporting other um, 
measures other parts of the soil that we're concerned about, like aggregate stability, which are related to so many other um, uh, ecosystem services. So the points, the larger points, uh, represent more stable aggregate. So what we have on the bottom one, each site is represented along the y-axis. First one, we have uh, the addition of cover crops at this Canadian site. And what we find is we have an increase in ratio. Then the California site, we have um, addition of soil health management practices. And what we get is this increase in ratio, but it's not a clear story because also there was a grassland system there and it had a decrease in ratio. Um, so I think there's really, it's, it's a really interesting ratio and a way of looking at the data to understand how the microbial community is responding to the immediate environment around it in this moment be, and, and get a better understanding of how management is influencing that because at the Utah site we see that it's not amendment strictly speaking that is um, the influence is the type of amendment here has different impacts whether it's manure or compost so I think it's a really interesting idea and one that we're certainly pursuing and, and evaluating and, and, and using in conjunction with looking at the total, how much biomarkers, how much laundry do we have in our basket? And we know that the diversity is important. We want um, all these different biomarkers present, but uh, we want to get a handle also on not only the diversity that's there, but also how it's responding to the environment. And um, so, like when I was collecting the last sample at the rangeland at 1-4, you know the climate, you know these inherent intrinsic properties. And then from that, um, you assess this, perhaps this ratio and understand within these caveats of the, uh, the landscape and the climate that you expect a certain ratio and that it's not quite there, but you also know it's heavily grazed. So you say, okay, reduce grazing, you increase carbon inputs, which will then provide the energy source for the microbial community, shift that ratio, and they're better able to support overall um, soil processes, uh, biogeochemical psyche, cycling and these ecosystem services that we want. So that's the idea that we're working with in terms of this data set is using the quantity, using the composition and looking at these ratios to tie in sort of this phenotypic expression of the, of the microbial community. And none of this, of course, as we've been seeing would be possible. I, I extend the greatest heartfelt thank you to all of our partnering scientists and to the funders and, and to the institutes that are continue to support me as I work through this data.